standing beside a work by Lucas Cranach the Elder, painted in 1526. The young woman in the painting is a 14-year-old Princess Sibyl of Cleves. She's wearing exotic fabrics and jewellery, and gold garlands, and silver netting in her hair. She's engaged and about to be married to her prince, who's pictured in the next portrait. Both paintings were acquired by the Grand Duchess Maria Popovna in the early 19th century, and thereafter donated to the Ducal Collection, which seems very appropriate given Cranach was employed by previous generations of the Ducal Court for many years. His was the era of the Reformation, and this was a location just as royal in important historical events as in the era of classical Weimar. As I've said before, it's not my intent to focus on history for its own sake. However, the Reformation is an important part of the identity of Weimar and this entire region, and it's played a significant part in the development of ideas too. By the early 16th century, the vision of a new renaissance of civilization in Europe was more than a hundred years old. It was fashioned in part on the rediscovery of classical Greek culture as it applied to art, architecture, politics, science and literature. And there was an increased focus on human derived values and the power of reason to analyse ideas. It looked to Plato's reference to Protagoras. Man is the measure of all things, of the existence of the things that are, and the non-existence of things that are not. Modern thinkers of the time, such as the Dutch theologian Desiderius Erasmus, following the scholastic heritage of Thomism and William Ockham, who were mentioned before, emphasised the creativity and dignity of human beings. They rejected the Augustinian notion that humanity has existed in a state of corruption since the fall from a state of grace. They refuted the idea of knowledge that sees truth as revealed exclusively by divine grace. It's also known by way of the reasoning faculties of mind and an associated emphasis on education and learning. Schuch wrote, Humanists everywhere in the 15th and 16th centuries were deeply concerned with education, for it was recognised by all as a path to knowledge and virtue for the individual and a source of hope for a saner and more harmonious world in which to live. Implicit in all that Erasmus wrote was the belief that men and women could become more human by way of education. Of course, these thinkers were committed to the Christ and loyal to the Catholic Church, but they looked back to a more compassionate and more humane tradition that claimed everybody would eventually be taken in God's house and receive salvation. Erasmus stood in contrast to the new generation of fundamentalists who rejected the humanist optimism of the Renaissance as mere triviality. After all, no recourse to reason was ever going to address the most important question of all, that of how to get to heaven. And furthermore, it was never going to offer an easy solution to the problem of corruption and hypocrisy in the church that was acting as a distraction from the teaching of scripture whereby not everyone would get to heaven. Consequently, they look back to the work of Augustine of Hippo, who'd lived in the 4th century on the North African coast in a bleak world of human desperation and misery. He had looked for explanation of the sorry state of humanity by way of scripture, and found it in the epistle of St Paul to the Romans. For the wages of sin is death. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Above all else, Augustine was interested in the implications of the wretched nature of humanity for soteriology, which is the science of how to circumvent death and finitude and, instead, exist forever, or in Augustinian terms, the study of sin and salvation. But in creating a theological narrative, he had to choose between two distinct roles afforded to God by convention. Was he the loving father, merciful and forgiving, magnanimous and compassionate, the kind of figure who might want to offer salvation to all? Or was he, above all else, the ultimate judge and jury, the arbiter between those who receive eternal salvation and those that don't, a figure capable of great wrathfulness? To justify his narrative, Augustine had to privilege the latter. Accordingly, right at the centre of his theology was ultimate reason behind human iniquity,
the tragedy of humanity's fall from grace when Adam and Eve ate of the forbidden apple in the Garden of Eden. He perceived this as the origin of a kind of inborn ancestral disease linking evil and sinfulness to what he considered to be the shameful act of eating apples. As a consequence of this inheritance, all humans by their very nature were born in a state of depravity and torment. Consequently, everybody needed salvation if they weren't to face an eternity of pain and anguish, and everything depended on the grace of the powerful God to offer this salvation. Everything. This was not something any individual humanist focused on the principles of reason and learning and education could remedy by themselves. Indeed, according to Augustine, nothing about humanity since the fall from grace had any real meaning or value or efficacy whatsoever, simply because it failed to gain mastery over salvation. I should add that the narrative posited by Augustine was not the only one of his era. Other contemporary theologians, such as Pelagius, citing Deuteronomy, every man shall be put to death for his own sin, had argued for the view that salvation could be achieved by way of human agency, and in particular, virtuous behaviour. He'd engaged in fierce debate with Augustine over the meaning and status of sin and salvation, a debate he finally lost in the year of his death in 418 at the Council of Carthage. Consequently, when the Reformation looked to the past for vindications of their new anti-theocratic stance, that grace was a gift not from the Church, but directly from God, made possible by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, then they looked to Augustine. I've come to the Wartburg Castle, which is near Eisenach, about an hour's drive from Weimar. Some of its structures date back to the 12th century, to before the Aristotelian tradition of Aquinas and Occam and Erasmus, and have hosted a considerable sequence of historical events since. This is the site of the Minstrels' Contest legend that was used by Wagner in his opera Tannhäuser. Also, this is the castle that inspired the Bavarian Ludwig II to build his Neuschwanstein Castle in the foothills of the Alps. The castle passed into the hands of the dukedom of Saxe-Weimar and Eisenach during the classical Weimar period, and now it's also listed as a UNESCO World Heritage Site. This is also where Martin Luther hid from his pursuers during the difficult years of the Reformation, and where he completed the very first translation of the New Testament into German. This is a portrait of Martin Luther when he lived here in 1521. He had needed to put away the priestly robes and disguise himself with a long beard as a minor lord living a life of idle amusement. Luther had trained in theology as a man of peace, but now he had upset the apple cart and become a threat to the status quo. There were many people of power and influence who wanted him done away with. Indeed, the Reformation concerned many political issues. Luther had stood up to the corruption in the church and the greed of monarchs. Even Erasmus had praised him for his stand in this area, but actually, above all else, he became embroiled in the debate about how to achieve or receive salvation. Actually, Martin Luther had been quite motivated by humanist ideals early in his life, but he'd become increasingly disillusioned by human potential over time. He came to loathe the principles privileged by the Aristotelian tradition, including that of nominalism, which had found an influential position in scholastic tradition of religious thought for more than 300 years. Instead, as I've indicated, Luther looked to Augustine's privileging of the doctrine of justification by faith, whereby all righteousness comes directly from God. Darmaid McCulloch said of this issue, from one perspective, a century or more of turmoil in the Western Church, from 1517, was a debate in the mind of long-dead Augustine. The question was this, do free will and autonomy represent an emancipatory force, leading to values of human worth and dignity, and implying, in theological terms, a doctrine of church leadership? Or is human efficacy a corrupting force, leading to debasement and requiring a doctrine of grace? It occurs to me that the question itself was bound to lead to disaster. If a person is convinced they need to attain salvation, 
and somebody else says they're going about it in the wrong way, whereby the deeds they perform, thinking they're doing right, are actually wrong, and the deeds they assume to be wrong are actually right, and actually they're not going to get salvation, despite all their best efforts, then clearly they're going to become rather incensed. They're going to get mad. This madness caused a rampage of intolerance and death and destruction and eventually the Thirty Years' War that in a single generation brought about the death of a quarter of the population of German-speaking Europe and furthermore, putting it in Hegelian terms, stunted the teleological progress of human thought for more than a hundred years. If the Renaissance had given greater status to the human mind than ever before, with a faculty of consciousness worthy of merit in itself, and mental processes able to create abstract thoughts and universal concepts by themselves, then the Reformation cast the mindset back into Neoplatonist terms. The cosmos was refashioned as comprising of an earthly realm and a divine realm, and the entity of mind was torn between the two, possessing a body tormented by free will, and therefore sin in the former, and a soul promised an eternal existence of delight by the latter. Notions such as love and compassion were not processes grounded in the human mind, which Schelling would later argue had organic, or in other words, evolutionary origins, but merely shadows of the archetypal form of love located in the divine realm. Luther explicitly argued for a doctrine of two kingdoms, whereby, although God is the ruler of the entire world, he rules in two distinct ways, by way of the law and by way of the gospel. God rules the earthly kingdom through secular government, promoting social justice by means of law and, where necessary, the sword. But also, God rules his spiritual kingdom, which is the source of righteousness and grace. One implication of this is that there need not necessarily be a particular divine grounding for political and economic ethics. Human reason, endowed by God, is enough to understand what a right act is in political and economic terms, even if, like everything else pertaining to human endeavour, it's meaningless in the end anyhow. Luther's theology implied that the scriptures do not offer any significant contribution to discussions about social ethics whatsoever. Indeed, Luther condemned the peasant uprising of 1525, not only on account of the terrible violence and bloodshed, but because it was focused above all else on material gain. The farmers were just as misguided as the priests in seeking political and economic power in the earthly kingdom. Indeed, Luther abhorred the church losing its influence in society to deceive individuals by way of the claim it could aid them in achieving the salvation of eternal existence. He detested the argument that if people donated their earthly possessions to assist the building of a new papal basilica and the upkeep of theocracy in general, given that the church was made representative by God of religious truth and material realm, then they would be rewarded with a kinder ear on Judgment Day. And furthermore, if they didn't donate to the church and receive a kind ear, then in contrast they would receive an unkind ear. Contribute to the church or be damned. Luther refuted this. He said that it's only by faith in Christ that a person can receive God's grace and attain eternal salvation. No intermediary is required. An individual can only obtain salvation by way of the divine reality that exists outside of themselves, which comes only from the Christ. Salvation is to be considered as an unconditional gift from God and not something to be earned by way of any particular deeds performed, whether in the name of Christ or otherwise. It's a part of God and of the Christ, a part of divine essence which is infused into the individual and which he or she can become aware of when possessing faith in the ability of Christ to, f to offer that righteousness. A person has to believe wholeheartedly that it's possible for him or her to receive God's grace to become aware of this gift of God's grace. They who know themselves to be righteous through faith shall know themselves to be righteous through faith. It's a circular tautology, but that's the point. Martin Luther wrote in his The Sovereignty of God, Bondage of the Will, that it's essentially necessary and wholesome for Christians to know that God foreknows nothing by contingency. <laughs> 
but that he foresees, purposes, and does all things according to his immutable, eternal, and infallible will. By this thunderbolt, free will is thrown prostrate and utterly dashed to pieces. Eat your heart out, Erasmus. In answer to the claims that the autonomy of contingent thought, including the powers of reason and rationalism, and all of those two times tables we teach children in grade one, possesses meaning in itself, Luther wrote, Are you not then the person, friend Erasmus, who just now asserted that God is by nature just and by nature most merciful? If this be true, does it not follow that he is immutably just and merciful? that as his nature is not changed to all eternity, so neither his justice nor his mercy. Luther was arguing that given the Supreme Being is perfect and he has already made all the perfect choices, not only do human actions or an autonomy of thought count for nothing in the kingdom of heaven, but the decision of who will achieve or receive eternal salvation and who will be damned to the opposite is predetermined. All individuals are fated from the time before their birth, from the time before time, either to an eternity of heaven or hell. Again, Luther is restating the theology of Augustine of Hippo, who argued that predestination is based upon God's foreknowledge of whether individuals will choose to believe and have faith or not. As I've said before, just as Plato had speculated on a realm of archetypal perfect forms which govern and enable the realisation of all matter, so Augustine had argued for a divine realm whereby God is the archetypal perfect form in whose image man has been created. God's perfection means that he is all-knowing, which includes his knowledge in advance of who's going to receive salvation. The point is this. The perfect deity could never change his mind about anything because this would contradict his perfection. And consequently, the decision about who receives grace is fixed. All those who receive salvation are predestined to receive salvation. A person doesn't achieve salvation by way of faith itself. They merely come to know they're predetermined to salvation by way of the fact that they have faith. Actually, Augustine later reinterpreted his reading of the scripture to some degree. He said that, given God governed all things, predestination of the soul is not necessarily based on God's foreknowledge alone of whether an individual will receive salvation because they come to faith that they will receive salvation, as that would imply a role for the efficacy of the individual characteristics or behavior of the person. Instead, predestination is based on God's will alone, which is mysterious and unfathomable to the human mind, given it encompasses the infinite possibilities of contingency. I should add that modern-day Lutherans reject the Augustinian doctrine of associating salvation with predestination. Redemption is said to come through Christ's sacrifice alone and faith in the efficacy of that sacrifice. Eternal damnation is similarly not predestined. It's the result of the unbeliever's sins and unbelief in the efficacy of Christ's sacrifice. Different leaders of the Reformation responded to different versions of the Augustinian doctrine of justification by faith. Zwingli in Zurich was convinced that he was one of the predetermined elect, given he realised he was one of the predetermined elect. And accordingly, he would remain so whatever mischief he got up to. John Calvin adopted the latter Augustinian view. Calvinists today, in their doctrine of unconditional election, posit that God's preselection of those who will receive salvation is an entirely autonomous act outside of time and space and based only on his own free will for reasons known only to the divine and certainly without having to revert to knowledge of a future contained by time and space, God has chosen who will join him in the kingdom of heaven. John Calvin argued, also like Zwingli, that the preselected can know who they are intuitively and that they can never lose their status as predestined to salvation, whatever they do. Calvin also argued that everybody else, those who are not preselected by God's will and his autonomous act outside of time and space, are fated to go to hell. There's nothing they can do about it. The point being, if humans are essentially worthless, then so is the established church too. Although actually, if I follow this line of argument further, which the leaders of the Reformation didn't, 
I might suggest that this soteriological autonomy is not quite as ruthlessly uncompromising as it might seem. The Autonomous Act position embraces an ontological stance whereby everything in the world is dependent upon God for its existence and meaning. Consequently, given that predestination is dependent upon ontological commitment to an entity that is everything, then actually there's no separation between God's autonomous efficacy and the actions of the individual. They're the same thing, identical. Accordingly, salvation exists simultaneously in a necessary and contingent state as regards human virtue. Calvinists do not claim to understand how this seeming contradiction works in practice. However, they make reference in the scriptures both to the autonomous authority of God and to the responsibility of humans to behave virtuously. I'm sure both Schelling and Kierkegaard would have appreciated this response. Indeed, there's a parallel between the linking of human soul and divine grace in Augustinian and Reformation doctrine and the linking of mind and nature in the Weimar Identity Thesis. Both look for a necessary identification between the two. Indeed, it could be argued that if Augustine was addressing the Plato-Aristotle divide pertaining to universals and particulars, and Luther was addressing the Augustine-Pelagius divide pertaining to human agency, and Hegel, Schelling and Goethe were addressing the Cartesian divide pertaining to mind and nature, then there's a common thread throughout. It's not about mind and nature, or earthly and heavenly kingdom at all. It's about the nature of the link between the two. Mind and the matter of human agency are determined not by itself in isolation, or by any kind of ontological commitment at all, but by its link with everything else. Indeed, the Weimar identity thesis, in identifying identity itself as a primary causal link between different types of possible entities, was to have meaning far beyond classical Weimar. But I'll get there later. At the beginning of this episode, I played a section from the second movement of my third symphony, subtitled Of Augustinian Soteriology and Hildegard's Harmony of All Heaven and Luther's Love and Grace. Here's another section now. Thanks for listening. <laughs>